Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm Jake. And this is Love You Like Crazy. This is a podcast where we talk and rant about young adult books. Awesome. So what's today's book, Carrie? Today's book is Ship It by Britta London. It is a a fairly recent book. Uh, Came out on May 1st, 2018. And then in our next episode, we're going to talk about 17th Summer by Maureen Daly, one of the first YA books. Yeah, I I think this is going to be really exciting. You know, we've done a lot of new stuff. We've done some older stuff, but now we're going to go like way back into... um, one of the first, you know, officially, you know, considered YA books. But first, we're going to talk about this super modern book, and we're going to go through all kinds of spoilers. And so, uh, you know, maybe you care about that, maybe you don't. But if you do, and you haven't read the book yet, pause it now, read it, and then come back and hear us talk about all manner of stuff. Yeah, if you like Tumblr and reach arounds, you're going to love this episode. Who doesn't? <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so uh, would you like to talk about this book? <laughs> yeah, I don't really know where to start. Th- like, do you, how do we want to tackle this sucker? Maybe some kind of quick plot summary would be good to start with, and then we could just talk about whatever the hell we want. I think, you know, like Claire and Tess, we just see where it goes. <laughs> 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 yes. Okay, so basically this this whole book is about um a girl who lives in the Middle East Jesus nowhere and she really loves this TV show, um Demon Heart. Mhm. And she she writes fan fiction about it and it is pretty erotic. Yes. As fan fiction is want to be um and she gets to go meet her her idols at a convention. Yeah. And that's where things get a little wonky. Because uh, the, it turns out that the show is actually uh, kind of on the verge of cancellation after a single season, which is why they're doing these convention tours. And additionally, uh, one of the actors, Forrest Reed, who plays the human um, Smokey, is... A, not that excited about going to conventions and actually meeting people who watch the show. And B, is really wants to get a job uh, acting in the lead in these series of uh, movies that are based on a video game that he really likes a lot. He's sort of young. He's immature. He hasn't been in the business very long. And um, he thinks all of this is pretty stupid, even though it's paying his rent. He also has a certain amount of internalized homophobia, I would say. Oh, there's a lot of it. Yeah. And so the fact that, you know, this young woman is writing him to be pretty gay doesn't work for him. So she uh, goes to the Q&A and asks basically if the these two characters, Smokey and Hart, uh, are actually in love and Forrest basically says that that's the stupidest thing he's ever heard and and called her crazy yeah and you know because she is a a, a tumbler girl yeah she just, she ends up schooling him on you know well I don't think crazy is the right word to use and yes <laughs> like ah I love it yeah it was uh yeah yeah so they they um as a as a way to sort of save face and also use her internet fame uh to their advantage they they rig a contest and invite her to um more conventions right so they're all traveling together and claire uh decides that it's her mission to convince jamie the showrunner who is like i would say there aren't too many like everyone in this book is kind of a douchebag but they're only a couple of people who are just, I would say, out and out villains and Jamie. Actually, Jamie isn't the worst of them, but Jamie is certainly. No, I don't. I The thing is, I didn't hate Jamie at the end or by the end. Right. I understood him in a way that I wish I didn't. But I didn't hate him. There are other people I actually really didn't like a lot more. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um. Yeah. So anyway, so that's her mission. Uh, and Jamie, for various reasons, um, is like, no way. 
So ultimately what happens is uh, Jamie decides that the only way to kill this whole thing is to kill the character of Smokey. And so he's off the show. Um, that's sort of, I don't know. I probably skipped a bunch of stuff. Skipped a bunch of stuff, but we can, we can, we can work through that, Jacob. Yeah. Uh, you're right. Claire gets into uh, sort of fights with Forrest, Jamie. Oh, she gets in fights with everybody. This girl, I mean, for better or for worse, Claire is fearless. And there's a lot of times where she's actually really nervous and really afraid, but she still goes for a lot of things that maybe a woman her age normally wouldn't do. Yeah. I mean, she be- she believes in this ship and she fights tooth and nail for it in a way that as a reader actually made me really uncomfortable. No, like some of these things are mistakes. <laughs> like they are bad ideas. <laughs> Huge mistakes. But it's true. Like she goes for it. But she still has people egging her on. I mean, she's not making these mistakes like in a bubble. No, that's true. So then uh, sort of the way that the, everything ends up is like basically everyone has some time to cool off. There's a final convention booking at San Diego Comic-Con where uh, <laughs> all sorts of things happen. So many, so many things. Basically, everyone makes up except Jamie. Clary comes out. Claire? Clary? Yeah. Claire comes out publicly as being queer. Forrest and Rico, uh, Rico being the other, the actor for the demon character named Hart, uh, smooch on stage. And um, the resulting publicity results in Demon Heart being renewed, though still without Smokey. Forrest gets b- booked on a new TV show. Claire and her hot girlfriend sort of seem to be forming a long-term relationship. And uh, that's more or less where it ends, I think. Yeah. So um, I feel like there was a key moment early on that, both of us really enjoyed, which is when she was writing fanfic in like the second chapter. Oh my God. <laughs> I was actually blushing. Uh huh. <laughs> so, you know, this, this woman, this young girl, uh, she's in the library in her high school. <laughs> mm-hmm. And she's like, now, how do I. How do I. How do I describe a reach around? <laughs> she's like, wait, you can. You can jerk a guy off from the rear, right? That's a thing, right? <laughs> I mean, I would think a girl who writes gay porn would have actually watched some gay porn before just being like, I wonder if this is possible. Because I bet you watch just a little bit of gay porn, you'll know what's possible. But, you know... That's what school libraries are for. That's right. That's where you watch the gay porn. So you can write your uh, your smutty fanfic about um, the the this supernatural TV show. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, um, but <laughs> yeah, but uh, I yeah, that was just that was just like a really funny thing for me. Yeah, she lives like where is she in like omaha or somewhere it's in well yeah it's in idaho uh i forget i wrote it down but then i deleted it yeah because i think the first um the first convention was like in the city but they don't live right it was in boise yeah so they're like an hour or an hour and a half outside of that maybe um her, her parents are you know her dad's a poet her mom is a sculptor they live in rural Idaho. Yeah. And and she, you know, Claire doesn't have any friends where she is because she's the only one like her, you know, where she lives. The popular kids are the kids who work on farms and wear overalls to school. Yeah. And she's also like figuring out her identity. And so like where there are kind of subgroups that maybe she could be a part of, um, it seems to me like she's not really comfortable in identif like there are some there are a small but existing number of gay kids in the school, but she and she definitely, you know, by the end of the book, she hasn't figured out exactly what she is, but she knows she's attracted to women, mm-hmm. you know, it seems like as well as as men uh, somewhat. And 
so if she were to, to decide to come out as queer, um, you know, she's like, I guess I would then have to be friends with these two people, <laughs> but she doesn't want to do that. Yeah. Like she doesn't want to be categorized in quite that way. Uh, so, you know, so she can't be in with the popular kids and then she also can't really get in with the subgroups either. So most of her thing is just being online and, and doing stuff on Tumblr. I'm sorry, I took over from you. No, it's okay. Um, there's there's a lot in this book. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, for being a really quick read, um, there is a lot going on. Um, you know, a lot of it is really just Claire figuring herself out and also the other characters sort of figuring out where they fit into the world as well. You know, Forrest being this young, maybe homophobic, you know, somewhat naive guy sort of figuring out, you know, hey, the world is bigger than my ego, <laughs> turns out. Um, and Rico being sort of a, a good guide through all of this um, because he's he's been in the business longer. Um, so there are other people sort of figuring themselves out. And I, I appreciate that, that it's not really just Claire's journey. It is also Forrest's journey. Yeah, I think that basically the, the characters who end up co coming off best are the ones who learn to kind of see things from other people's perspectives. Yeah. Because what I didn't like about Claire um, so much was that, you know, she was so tunnel vision focused on making this slash happen for real that it, it, it was it was too much for me in a lot of ways. And I'm like, I, I understand why she's doing this and I, I understand why the writer wants her to do this. But it also like as the reader I was uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, I get where you're coming from, Claire, but no. Um, but by the end, I mean, maybe it's because she still got what she wanted, basically. Well, right. I mean, she did, but not in the sort of manipulative way that she was planning to. No, I mean, they, they you know, Forrest chose to do what he did. You know, he was not forced into it, tricked into it. He chose that. And that ended up being a really good move for him. But it was still just like, did we need to do all this? Yeah. Well, she, maybe, we, maybe, and maybe we did. I mean, by the time she's like breaking into the showrunner's uh, Twitter account and holding it literally hostage. Yeah, that was, that was bad. It's pretty clear that I know. Oh, so we won't use the word crazy because that is, uh, you know, that has some sort of ableist underpinnings, but like something has gotten out of whack here. Yeah. I mean, it was a lot. I think, I think she was trying to do more than seemed necessary for <laughs> it was, it was a lot. And, and, you know, the fact that, um, Katie, who is, um, not the PR person, but the, um, She's sort of the the social media person for the the Demon Heart team. Mm -hmm. You know, she definitely egged this on. She knew about the plan, and she she sort of gave her the go ahead um, because she wanted this ship to happen as well. And I was like, "You're the grown up in this situation. Stop it." Yeah, like I feel like I feel like as readers, we're supposed to like the marketing people, but. <laughs> They oh, no. they make some questionable decisions. I mean, I suppose maybe it's uh, maybe it's justified for them by the fact that the show gets picked up for a second season. But man, it's uh, it's rough stuff. Yeah, I would say Paula is actually my least favorite character in the whole book. She was actually one of the more manipulative people, hmm. you know, because her only job is to get this show renewed. That's it, and she was going to use every tactic and every angle she could to make that happen and she was scary <laughs> and so you know she knew that claire was sort of a loose cannon and was just like okay she's gonna get clicks she's gonna get views let's let her you know embarrass people or make people uncomfortable because it's going to get people to watch my show. Mm -hmm. Fuck off. Yeah, right. And it's not like 
people are jealous of Claire that she gets to go along with the the Demon Heart crew, but it's not being done for her. It's yeah, you're right. It's being done totally for it's, it's sh- for you know for Paula and for you know for Demon Heart and, and Claire knows this. Yeah, there's one part you know they pull her her name out of this you know cauldron. And then she looks later and there's nothing in there. And she's like, hmm, I wonder where all the other names went. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, there there were no other names there, Claire. And you know this. And she did figure it out later that, you know, she was definitely chosen for this um, opportunity of a lifetime. But, yeah, she was being used. Okay, so 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 you chose this book. I did. And why did you choose this book? So... Uh, The reason that I read the book myself originally is that the author is Britta London, L-U-N-D-I-N. And she is one of the writers on the TV show Riverdale, which you and I watched for bonus content for the Ear Trumpet audio feed. We certainly did. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And we also watched the first episode of season two. But I have gone no further. Yeah, me either. You, you, You haven't either? No. Oh, oh, Jacob. Yeah. We might have to. So Riverdale. Oh, yes. Britta London. And so she co-wrote one episode of the first season of Riverdale. By the way, I feel like um, her experiences on Riverdale probably informed like what she writes about Jamie, Uh, you know, and is one of the reasons why he's more he seems he's weirdly more sympathetic than it seems like he should be. Yeah, because I think, you know. As, as a writer of a TV show, you know, when when Claire's holding his phone hostage, you know, he's saying, do you think this is all me? Like, do you understand, like, how many people, like, touch this before it gets aired? Like, I, I don't have any control at this point. And I think as, as myself, if I were going to write a book like this, I'd just be like, I don't know how TV goes. Right. <laughs> so I do appreciate that, you know, I, I do have that sort of sense of like, oh, this is actually someone who does understand what it's like to make a TV show. And so that's that's maybe why Jamie became more sympathetic to me, because I was like, oh, it's not that he because he's writing this stuff. So he and he admits, you know, he is queer baiting. Mm-hmm. So it's not that he's necessarily not going to want these characters to be gay or doesn't think that they're gay or doesn't, you know, want the audience to think that they're gay. It's that there's a whole lot of other people who are also involved in censoring and and tweaking before it's aired. Right. And Riverdale, like, so uh, Britta London is is queer. Um, and the person who, the, the showrunner for Riverdale also is himself a gay man, I believe. Mm-hmm. So Riverdale, uh, you know, it, it's, it has one, well, depending on how you count it, but like there's basically one gay character. One, one gay character and a couple of people who are occasionally gayish right and so then and there is some kind of queer baby stuff with betty and veronica for instance oh absolutely you're right yeah but and you know and so i wonder like maybe it is the case that the network uh you know maybe the cw is like so you know you can have some gay characters but the main cast can have you know I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. This is all speculation, but I don't know. But you know, I think you're probably on the right track if if you're not completely right, because you know, no matter what, the CW isn't going to have Betty and Veronica in bed. Yeah, not in the first season, anyway. Not in the first season. <laughs> I mean, if this were HBO, that'd be a different story. Uh, so anyway, uh, I mean, you can have. Archie fucking Miss Grundy, sure, but oh, absolutely. Um, right. So anyway, so Britta London uh, co-wrote one episode in the first season, which when we watched it, there were like parts of that episode that were very good, and there were parts that were very bad, and we were like, oh, which who wrote what? <laughs> so I I looked her up, and I'm like, I wonder if she's on Twitter, and of course she is. Like, why wouldn't she be? Unless they've gone past it and are only on Instagram or some damn thing. I'm old. Yeah. So. 
Um, so I, I looked her up on on Twitter, and I'm like, oh, this seems like a cool person and entertaining. So I guess I'll follow her on Twitter. And then at some point, she was like, hey, I wrote this book. So I thought, oh, I'll check out this book. Hopefully, it'll be good. And maybe it will answer the question of, is she actually a good writer? Do I think that she is responsible for the good parts from that episode? Uh, and I feel like the answer to that is yes. I think she was, yeah. So I got the book, I read it, and then I'm like, man, there's a lot to talk about here. I think this would be fun to talk about uh, with Carrie. And here I am. So here we are. And then I was like, God, I have no idea how we're going to talk about any of this. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. So far, so good, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, as a person who is a total nerd and a fan of a lot of things like I enjoyed, you know, reading about people going to cons and and sort of getting to be with the people that are also into the same things they are. Like I love that. Yeah. And you know, of course there's a meet cute and that's going to get me every time. So when um when Claire is in line to get into the Demon Heart panel for the first time, she, you know, she trades uh, Tumblr uh, with with this girl. And then the other girl's like, oh, God, you're Heart of Lightness. Oh, shit, you're super famous. And they blush and they're like, oh, you're pretty. Oh, you're pretty. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, this is the greatest thing ever. I love them. I ship them so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And so let me ask you uh, some real life questions. Yeah. So have you have you ever been to any kind of con? Or- have I been to cons? Yes. Yes. How many? God, how many? Um, ugh, seven or eight, maybe. Not that many. But the first one I ever went to, I walked right into Seven of Nine's boobs. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was not paying attention to where I was going. And Jerry Ryan was coming in and I was walking out and boom. Uh-huh. Right into some boobs. Please state the nature of the medical emergency. There isn't one yet. I have only been to one con, which was, uh, I mean, uh, a convention like this anyway. I've been to some folk music conventions, which are a completely different kettle of fish, I would have to say. <laughs> They're nerds in a different way. They are. There's less shipping. Look out at the cross tree stood, the spyglass in his eye. But I went to Rhode Island, the first Rhode Island Comic Con, and I'd never been to a convention before. And like, I walked in, and like, there are all, the, you know, there's all the cosplayers and things. And I just like, you know, because I don't really like crowds and I have trouble, I don't like people in general. Uh, I'm right there with you, Jacob. So I wasn't sure if I was going to like it, but I thought it was great. I just had a great time. It was one, you know, all of the cosplayers, some of them were, you know, had like spot on costumes, others were like more kind of you know, uh, not as... Yeah, I mean, there are professional cosplayers and, and there are people who dress sort of like a character because they really love them and there's everyone in between. And it's all great. Like, yeah, I just loved it all. And uh, I think the best was like this, I don't know, this 10-year-old kid who is dressed as um, Lando Calrissian from uh, Star Wars and just like walked around with the perfect Lando Calrissian at attitude and you know 10 year old and just like and i was like that kid is the best yes after walking around for a while my feet really hurt and i ended up going to well let me ask you this did you go to have you ever been to like any kind of panels or things that were for things that you didn't really know or care much about oh absolutely (laughs) um so i'm really into video games that's sort of my thing so there have been video game conventions around here because there are some uh, bigger video game companies um, in this area. So there have been uh, escapist conventions and that's a video game like review site. And so they've had some escapist cons here. And um, I went to one panel that I thought was going to be really interesting because it was all about women in games. All the panelists were men. Oh, that's <laughs> all uh... the people in the audience were men. Hmm. And, um, it was real uncomfortable, <laughs> but I stayed through the whole thing because I just wanted to like hate watch everything. <laughs> so there, there have been panels that I've been on where I'm just like, I either don't know what's going on because, but you know, whatever the topic sounded interesting. I went to one that before we ever had this um, podcast, I went to one that was all about like how to 
do a podcast. Oh, that's cool. And so that was fun. Um, but yeah, and then I've been to some really, you know, exciting and interesting ones. How about you? I went to a panel just because my feet were tired and I wanted to sit down for a while. Uh, and it ended up being for about the Power Rangers and they had like, you know, five of the original Power Rangers up there on stage talking about it, answering questions. And I, I never watched the Power Rangers. Like maybe I saw parts of a, a few shows and I always thought like, you know, this is like, this is a show to sell toys to small children and <laughs> which it totally is, but and it looks it looks really bad. And I still I mean, hopefully nobody out there is too offended by this. Like, that's still basically my opinion of the show. But I was impressed at like people were asking questions of of the you know, of the actors and they were they were like break, you know, they were crying like that show really meant a lot to a lot of people. And it kind of, you know, I was kind of reminded that in the beginning of the book where Forrest like first comes to this convention and is, and is like, holy shit, I have never seen anything like this in my life. And then also, you know, after thinking of this show as like, this is great. I no longer have to do commercials for a while. And maybe, maybe after I've done this for a while, I can do, go on and do something that is more like what I actually want to do. And then, to sort of find out that it's important to people in this way, mm -hmm. you know, and he finds that kind of touching. And ultimately that's one of the things that leads to him being like, you know, saying like what we think the show is about is not as important as what you think the show is about. And while it's true that these characters are never going to be um, in love, you know, in Canon on the show, like, here's a little something for the for the ladies out there, you know, or whatever. Uh, that's sort of what brings them to that. One of the things that brings them to that point. Um, and I thought that that was, you know, I thought that was an interesting portrayal of that. Yeah. I mean, I think throughout the whole book, you know, all of the little moments that Forrest had, you know, from, you know, just sitting in his his hotel room alone and playing video games and eating pizza and the time that he goes to the the dairy queen to get his um his peanut butter ice cream i'm just like he's going to evolve and i'm going to i'm going to be so proud of him mm -hmm. yeah and i really was like i was i was touched by his thoughtfulness um in that last panel um because he he finally saw his fans as people who had you know valid viewpoints and not just nerds who didn't know what they were talking about yeah but also this book is bonkers yeah yeah <laughs> like i can't keep saying like oh there's this really touching moment i'm like claire is a bulldog she wants them to have this canon relationship and it ain't gonna happen but she is doing literally so many weird things to try to make this happen you know like we said taking the showrunner's phone and and or not phone but taking his twitter account and tweeting on his behalf and um you know writing fan fiction about the actors using their full names oh that's so bad. Oh, that was so wrong. And she knew it was wrong, but she still did it. And I'm like, okay, you know what? You're still a teenager. Your brain's not fully developed. I get it. But <laughs> oh, that's, that is really rough. And, you know, even if you had done that, you must have felt that pang of regret a fucking minute later and you could have deleted it. But no, you left it up. Yeah. And that was shady. And I did not like that. So I thought it was interesting how that was handled in the book. This is, this may be a little bit of inside baseball. Uh, but so uh, someone that you and I both know, although, uh, or I think you know her. Um, I'm going to beep out the name, but uh, do you remember from Stitch and Pitch? Maybe. Like how long ago? Oh, Christ, man. I don't know. <laughs> it's been so long. Okay. Anyway, so right. So this uh, this this person that I, I uh, that used to live in Providence that I knew um, is super into fanfic, and 
is an occasional contributor to a podcast, which I should have looked up the information for, but I didn't. That is about sort of fanfic and issues that come up in fanfic. Hello, and welcome to the OTP, the one true podcast for fan fiction readers, writers, and lovers. You're about to hear a frank, free-flowing conversation about fic. Between a moderator and contributors from a wide range of fandoms, perspectives, and experiences. Because of that, things may get explicit. They may also contain spoilers, so please listen with discretion. And I've listened to some episodes, and um, so I know that this this thing of writing fanfic about actual human beings who exist in the real world, that is a thing that does happen, and it's, so, as you might imagine, somewhat controversial within the community. Yeah. I mean, I can totally see, like, sometimes this would be kind of hot, or this would be kind of interesting, but, like... I don't know. I guess I wouldn't want someone to write a fanfic about me banging my coworker. No. Because that's like a professional relationship. And even if it's not true, I'm like, someone's going to maybe think it could be. And if it's got my full name there, like that's, uh, I mean, there's, even if you're famous and even if your job is to be an actor, even if your face is out there in the public. I mean, there are still some things that you should be able to keep private. And it just seems like such a violation of privacy. So in the book, like, she sort of defends, you know, she's like, no, people do this all the time. And Fora says, that's all well and good. But you included details that you knew from private conversations with me. And that's where it's, that's, you know, that mm -hmm. really pushes it over the line. So I thought it was kind of interesting that he made that distinction, which I think in real life maybe he wouldn't. But yeah, I think that that's, you know, comes from the author's probably experience with the fanfic community and, and knowledge of this sort of. But like um, uh, Tess's first ship was the Jonas Brothers. So so there you go. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know about that, but whatever. Yeah. They're they're literally family, but okay. Um so what is your experience with fan fiction? Do you read any? Do you do you are you at all immersed in the fan fiction world? I am not. So this was actually sort of a, a teaching moment for me as well as Forrest. So I've been thinking about this uh somewhat since since i read the book first um and i don't you know i've never been super into fanfic i've never read a ton of it um i've occasionally run into sort of bits and pieces of it uh for instance i emailed you earlier this uh fanfic that someone wrote of anthony bourdain going to narnia you sure did <laughs> um which was and that was actually like okay so that's real person fanfic but it was like it was both Tongue in cheek and spot on. Yeah. And apparently he enjoyed it. It sounded like he was a little weirded out by it, but also <laughs> thought it was good. Oh yeah. Let me let me find this because I I uh because I I also felt like his response to it could be, you know, uh Forrest's entire character arc, you know. <laughs> like in <laughs> in one short thing. Um so someone at the New Yorker sent him a copy of this fanfic and, and asked him if he had read it. And uh, he said that he hadn't. Um, but he says, uh, this is astonishingly well-written with an attention to detail that's frankly a bit frightening. I'm both flattered and disturbed. I think I need a drink. <laughs> yeah. So so I, I came across that today. Uh, there was... So uh, maybe the... <laughs> my first or one of my first experiences with fanfic was a while ago, I discovered this live journal community where uh, someone, you know, would use a random number generator to, to randomly generate pairings and then assign them to people to write. So it was kind of a, uh, uh, a challenge, um, you know, and the one that I remember uh, paired Sawyer from lost with Johnny five from um, short circuit. <laughs> Oh, dear Lord, no. <laughs> yeah, so it was slash fiction about them. And uh, so that stuck with me for whatever reason. And then I also read this. I discovered this small but um, enjoyable uh, niche of fanfic, which was about characters from Doctor Who knitting. 
and uh, I enjoyed that. All these are like gone to the depths of time, as far as I can tell, um, since those old sites no longer really exist. So there was a part of this book that actually really stood out to me, and it sort of reminded me like how selfish Claire is Mm -hmm. because she's actually, you know, she's very, she's being very manipulative and she's being really selfish and she's having this, you know, she's, she's sort of maybe into this girl Tess and, um, you know, they're sort of trying to feel each other out, um, literally and figuratively. Indeed. But she's, um, Tess is not as like determined to have this whole ship thing happen for real. She's like, I don't need this to be canon. I, I, I'd like it where it is. Like, that's why I'm a fan of it. And she gets really mad at Claire because she's like, Claire, like, you're only caring if there are gay people represented. You're not looking for people of color. You're not looking for, um, for other for other um, representation in this you're only caring about what matters to you you're not really caring about what's what matters to everybody and i think that was the moment where i was just like oh claire's either going to get it or she's not and she kind of shut down for a while you know mm-hmm. because she 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 gets so mad at tass and she's like you know what does she say? Um, so the um, Tess says, you know, of course it is. You know how many black characters have been on Demon Heart? Like two. And they were both demons. Now they're dead. You've never mentioned it. You only care about the thing that affects you. I do care about that. But look, we can still make Smoke Heart queer. <laughs> but we can't make them black. And I was like, oh! Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Oh! Mm-hmm. And and that's and oh that bothered me so much. I was like, Claire, this ain't how you get a cute girlfriend. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. And then right after that, like, um, Tess's friends show up, and Tess is all like, "I don't want my friends to know that I'm into this TV show because that would be embarrassing." And Claire, being a complete rude person, says, oh, actually, um, she's totally into this. She was here for this. Um, She's a nerd. Bye. So that bothered me as well, um, because I felt like, I mean, I, I, I don't think that the author is unaware that this is sort of problematic, but I still I'm not sure. Oh, no, I, I think she totally knows that it's problematic. I, I don't I don't doubt that. But I don't know that she stuck the landing just in terms because it kind of feels like she's equating liking fanfic with being queer in in a high in a often homophobic society. And I don't think that that equation works very well. Um, and then also it kind of the it. It, the blow is kind of softened in that when it turns out that Claire, you know, outing her friend or her girlfriend or whatever, um, it that turns out to have been a good thing because most of her friends are fine with it. And the one who isn't kind of gets shouted down and shuts up about it. But just like it wasn't Tessa's place to tell Claire's mom that Claire is gay it really wasn't Claire's place to say anything to Tess's friends and there's another quote that I want to read because you know fuck this why not yeah she says I did the right thing I know I did but my stomach can't stop turning over the way Tess is staring open mouthed at me hurt and betrayed I've never made anyone look at me like that before but she should feel so free right now. She doesn't have to lie anymore. <sighs> Again, oh, Claire. Oh, Claire, baby. Because when Tess does the same thing to her, she freaks out. She doesn't want to talk to her mom. She wants to go right home. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, well, 
Claire, I mean, you're free. You don't have to lie anymore. Why are you so upset? Oh, you realize other people are human. Yeah. Way to go, Forrest. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree with that message. I just, I don't, I wasn't real happy with how it was put across. No, I, I it made me, it, it made me very unhappy. It made me um, uncomfortable with, with, with Claire. I Maybe even more than, than it made me with Tess because Claire, Claire started it and Claire was really, I mean, she, she cut Tess down in a way that, I mean, you either fight or flight at that point and what's it going to stop you to, to fight? You know, what are you going to lose? Yeah. And also, like, we know in the book that Claire, like, the fact that Claire's mom thinks that she's gay is not actually a problem. Like, she is 100% fine with that. Yeah. I mean, her mom was, like, giving her the thumbs up and, like, yay, maybe she's kissing this girl. Woo! She's a cute girl. Yeah. Um, you know, so her parents are really open and liberal. <laughs> like oh okay i mean i understand of course why you're so upset you know figuring yourself out is a huge thing and being different and being you know different in a place like rural idaho cannot be easy um but so i don't know if i liked this book yeah but i know i enjoyed this book which is a different thing entirely um i enjoyed sort of the I mean, I actually really liked, you know, feeling like part of the the nerd in crowd. Like, oh, I I know what it's like to go to cons, and I know about all this stuff. Yay! Um, but when you um told me that this sort of like at least like a little bit came out of supernatural, yeah. I, I have never seen Supernatural, but I know what the two main characters w- look like, and I know I would like them to kiss. <laughs> so, I approve. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. We haven't really talked about that, but uh, I found, well, I, I found because she retweeted it, but um, the author, uh, Britta London, posted a tweet, which I will now pull up. Um, she posted a tweet in 2015, which says the character list for my movie ship. It is just a delight so far. I'm so excited about this script. So it was originally going to be a movie and the cast is, uh, comics, dude, convention worker, crybaby gamer, <laughs> Dean Winchester, who is one of the characters on uh, supernatural dumb gamer entitled bus dude, excited fan. And then fan one, fan three, fan four, fan five. <laughs> and someone replied, Lord help Dean Winchester if he meets excited fan. And she says, ha, basically the plot of the whole thing. So, uh, yeah, so it is based on Supernatural. And there was, I guess, this incident uh, some at some time ago where, you know, uh, at the... The primary shipping that goes on in that show is not between the two main characters who are brothers. I, I mean, still, I, 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 I'd watch it like because they're not brothers in real life like the Jonas brothers are. So it's OK. I'm not saying there isn't that <laughs> shipping, but the the big one that I'm aware of, at least, is between, I think, Dean and uh, Castiel, I think, is the other character who is an angel. Well, yeah, because in this book, I guess um, when they were at San Diego Comic-Con, um, she was like walking across the street with her parents and she's like, oh, there's a Castile. There's another Castile. I think that's a little nod to this. And OK, I just looked up the student. Yeah, he's pretty cute. <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm OK with this. And there was an incident where like a uh, a woman got up at a convention Q&A and says. Hello. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, I love you character. I'm bisexual, and I've noticed some possible subjects. That I the crowd immediately started to boo, and the actor who plays Dean was like, I'm thoroughly confused. Okay, Bill's got a tavern. Bill's got a tavern. Really? The first question? And she then got, like, sort of shuffled off before she got a, a chance to read the question. She wrote her account of the whole thing, which is also interesting. I'm going to link to all this stuff in the show description. But um, so I think that that was kind of the, you know, somewhat directly the inspiration to this. Although 
I see that in the author's tour, she kind of downplays that connection. Well, I'm sure that there's, you know, at, at some point you want to take ownership of your own stuff and, and make it completely separate from from something else. So mm -hmm. there's probably a good reason to downplay the supernatural when you want it to stand on its own. Right. So uh, the one other thing that I kind of wanted to mention, because I thought it was relevant to this book and kind of how Claire um, develops through it is that uh, this fantasy author named Sam Sykes posted uh, this, this was a while ago, I think years ago, uh, a, on Twitter, this thing, which is stages of a toxic fandom, which step one is I love this. Step two is I own this. Step three is I control this. Step four is I can't control this. Step five is I hate this. And step six is I must destroy this. And that's <laughs> been playing out a lot, you know, in like Star Wars fandom and stuff uh, where people are just going wild. Are they? Uh, and driving people off the internet and stuff. Yes. Did you not know about this? No, I did not know about this. Oh. Okay. Oh, so it's this Kelly Marie Tran. Yes. So and she's in Last Jedi. Yeah. So this says Carl, uh, Kelly Marie Tran leaves social media after months of um, harassment. Yeah. So that's the sorts of things that are going on right now. Why? Why would? Why? That's shitty. It is. It's very shitty. That's super shitty. Like, why do people do that? That's that's. That's a person. Right. And and of course, that brings me back to Claire. Like, come on, Claire. These are people. Right. And so Claire doesn't. Claire does actually kind of end up destroying uh, at least the. You know, that one character gets killed off, but but she kind of pulls back from the brink finally. But before that, there's like she really wants to control it. She really tries very hard to control what's on this show. And um really resists that it's not under her control. Yeah, I mean, because what what Forrest really wants, you know, he he sees he sees this as a stepping stone. He sees Smokey as, you know, this is a a, a great character to play for now. You know, I don't want to do this forever. I really want to um be in this red zone movie. Um and he's almost there. Like he he doesn't really like John Reynolds anymore. Uh but he's he's so close. He can he can taste it. Yeah. And after after San Diego like that's done. Yeah. John Reynolds I think is maybe the least likable character in the book. Yeah, he he's he's my villain. Like I hate him. Um what did I all right. Oh, yeah. The guy who makes the Red Zone movies that Forrest wants to star in super masculine God of War type shit. Uh, right. We we are introduced to him in person when he says, I mean, this is a comics convention. When did the industry start caring about what 14 year old girls like? It's like, yeah, fuck you, guy. I'm like, uh, they should have been caring about what 14 year old girls like always because 14 year old girls are style makers. 14 year old girls run the fucking world. Yeah. And also, and he's like, do you want to be a tiger beat boy your whole life or do you want to act? Which is like, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, I will say this, uh, the genre of movies based on video games is not highly regarded in the world at large as a rule. I don't know. People really like the Tomb Raider movies. That's true. I haven't seen them. I do. Resident Evil. Uh, yeah. Should I keep going? I liked the first Mortal Kombat movie. <laughs> I don't hate the Super Mario Brothers movie. I haven't seen it. I kind of feel like I should. Oh no, it's terrible. Um, it would. It's it's something that maybe you need to watch a riff track of. Yeah, that's fair. I I could do that. Anyway, I forget what we were talking about. I don't know. We're we're sort of rambling at this point because there's again, this is one of those books that there's like a lot to say, but also it's got a pretty simple, straightforward plot. Yeah. So it's, a lot of stuff happens, but also nothing happens. It happens over the course of like three conventions and a couple of bus rides. So um, I guess maybe we could just sum it up then. Like, I feel like it was uh, it was pretty well written. Um, there were some things I didn't like, but on the whole, you know, I thought it was I, I enjoyed reading it. I thought it was a good. 
it was worth reading. Yeah, I think if Britta London comes out with another book, I'll probably read it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, sometimes it's got, you've got a little preciousness in a first book. And maybe your second book sort of comes into its own. Um, I mean, I think she's got the skills. So I think she does. I mean, she did some of my best jug headlines. So yeah, or at least I'm going to assume <laughs> she did. Britta London, thank you for writing some good jug headlines. And if you can um, have Cole Sprouse call me. Yes. I would appreciate that. That's true. We should be start using our clout as world famous podcasters to get these kinds of interviews. Obviously. Or not one on one interviews that are not recorded in some cases, perhaps. Yes. I'm like, could we have a couple of one on one naked interviews, please? Yeah. I shouldn't say stuff like that out loud. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know, Carrie. I ship it. Thank you. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so y'all, this was um, this was "Ship It" by Britta London. Um, I I give it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know if I give it like three demon hearts or or four demon hearts, but um, I do I do give it some some demon love. So um, thank you, Britta London, for um, teaching me about um, reach arounds. Appreciate it. <laughs> That goes on the book jacket, I think. <laughs> <laughs> As well it should. Thanks for the London. Oh man. Well, yeah. Um, so the next book so the next book we're gonna read, I've got Seventeenth Summer. <gasps> oh, that's right. Oh, that's gonna be fun. Seventeenth Summer is like one of the first like official YA books ever. And I'm pretty excited. Yeah. And it's by Maureen Daly. And uh, yeah, I'm interested to see what it's all about. It's going to it's it's going to be something. It's, it sure is going to be something. Anyway. So if you if you have any comments or anything that you want to say to us, uh, you can send an email to podcast at love you like crazy dot com or contact us via the Facebook group or the Facebook page. We're on Twitter. We're at at Love YA Pod, uh, and we will respond. And we might read your thing on the show. In fact, probably we will, unless you tell us not to. Do we have anything to read this time? No. Damn it all. Sorry. Oh, that's the worst. Um, Carrie mentioned that our podcasting network, which is Ear Trumpet Audio, has a Patreon page. Uh, so if you go to eartrumpetaudio.com. Or patreon.com slash ear trumpet, I think. Um, you can pledge money to it and it'll help support the network. And if you support it at the $5 a month le level or higher, you get all the bonus content, including us talking about the first season of Riverdale. Riverdale. The, there are tons of other great podcasts on the network. Notably, uh, I wanted to bring your attention to Can We Cult, which is sort of like this podcast if we talked about cults instead of young adult novels. <laughs> uh, and they recently did a two-part um, series on the Westboro Baptist Church. And the second episode in particular was an interview with a woman who grew up in that neighborhood. Oh, God. That the Westboro Baptist Church is located in. Yeah. And currently works in Equality House, which is that house that's across the street from uh, the compound. That's all painted like a rainbow? Yeah, exactly. I love that. Yeah. So she has some stories about that and it's pretty interesting and cool. And I recommend checking it out. Um, yeah. So I think that's everything. So, <laughs> so tired. Um, Jacob Haller, why are you so tired? I don't know. Uh, I went to my, I went to my therapist uh, on Tuesday for the first time in about a month. And so we talked about various things, a bunch of things saved up. And then at the end, I was like, I was trying to think if there was anything I forgot about, you know, my therapist was like, yeah, maybe there's some things we could talk about next time. And I was like, well, I guess, I guess in any other therapy session, I probably would have brought up at some point when uh, my downstairs neighbor put up a pornographic banner on our porch. 
and <laughs> but that ended up working itself out, it right? Because you talk to them and they're like, "Oh yeah, oops," and and so you're like, "I know confrontation isn't my thing, but right, yeah, everything worked. I was very proud of you." Yeah, but uh, it was definitely like I was like, "Should I should like always leave them wanting more?" Be the the approach I take to my therapy sessions. Maybe not. Mm. Anyway, that poster was something. It was it was something. It was a tacky thing. <laughs> that I did not want on my porch. <laughs> no, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Like, I don't care, you know, about a lot of things, but that's a communal area. And uh, that's one big old dick and a vulva and... And the word entrance, which... <gasps> oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway very good well it's been great talking to you Carrie it's, as it always is it's so great talking to you I'm really excited to talk about the next book which I need to get I'm sure it's free which is my favorite kind of book yeah that's true and I will talk to you soon love you like crazy love you like crazy too give me a call when you get back hey there hey love I EarTrumpetAudio.com Ideas and entertainment. Loud and clear. <laughs> okay, I feel like that was pretty good. <laughs> uh, oh my god. I'm going to turn on the air conditioning. Oh my, <laughs> your air conditioning isn't on? No, it's too noisy. Oh god, I'm... I want to be southern for a second, but bless your heart. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, yeah, that maybe is why I, I flag at around the 45 minute mark in these uh, summer recordings. You're like, oh, that's right, because I'm about to die. I'm literally yeah. on my deathbed. What the fuck?